Yeah, greetings uh, and welcome to this city of Windhoek, you know, in Namibia, uh, one of the southern African states, you know, on the, this is the Atlantic Ocean, you know, uh, it is from this ocean, it's this ocean, this ocean is also good and it's also bad. So please go ahead, introduce yourself. Um, my name is Sandra Richards. I am affectionately known as Sister Doctor, Sandra Richards. The sister comes from me being very connected and uh, very involved with my community. I um, got my doctorate, and my research is uh, on an area that I will speak of shortly, but um, I was very clear I did not want to just be called doctor and then forget the origins. Uh, I think once you forget your roots, then your fruit will perish. So I was, my parents are from the Caribbean, from the island of Barbados. And I was earthed and raised in the UK, in London. And very early became aware of issues of injustice because I was in school when a lot of when a lot of um, Africans came from the Caribbean to join their parents who had been invited to the UK to help build um, to rebuild war-torn Britain. I noted when I was in school that a lot of these young people that looked like me were being treated very differently to me. Um, there was a harshness, there was an injustice. I didn't understand what it was about, but I knew it wasn't fair. So I think that's when I began to be aware of these social injustices and other things that I can refer to a little bit later. And so um, my, my interest was heightened because of these issues. I wanted to intervene, but uh, my parents quite rightly were concerned that I should not be involved in something I didn't really understand. So I took the time to listen and learn more. I became aware of the civil rights movement in the States. Um, and just wanted to do something. I wanted to ensure that justice prevailed. So I would say it's not fair and what's going on. Um, as I grew older, I understood better the idea of keeping the people um, uh, oppressed and marginalized. And I became aware of things like misdiagnosis and uh, punitive approaches to education and I decided when I was old enough to look more closely at this with the view of making a difference not just so I would say oh I know what it, why it's happening but so that I could do something about it although I did not know what I would do about it when I had my own family I was particularly careful to be involved and be involved in the decision-making aspect of my children's education and have a different approach to education, which is that the school is actually fortunate to have my child rather than I am fortunate to put my child in that school. It's a completely different way of looking at things. I also was increasingly aware of the lens that, you know, melanin-rich, dark-skinned people were being viewed through. It was one that put us at a disadvantage, as I said before. So I wanted to understand education a little bit more and decided that schooling was very different from education. Schooling was about streaming you into being subservient, to being a consumer, and to knowing your place. Education is a, a far more rounded and richer experience. It's a lived experience. It speaks to a world history and not a history through a tinted lens which puts the ones who oppress as being um, the ones who bring civilization and who are kind and, and who 
take care. I wanted the, the truth to be something that we all understood. On my journey, I found a lot of pain. Pain for myself, as I became aware that people didn't tell me, but also pain for others that came from other places and became black. So we stopped being Africans and humans and, and our names, but we became something called black. And these things intrigued me. As time has gone on, I have chosen to do research in this area to understand whether or not there's an alternative frame of reference, whether the frame of reference, which is a Eurocentric frame, is the only one and how it serves us. So I have become an African-centered scholar, activist. That's what I am. I'm a Pan-Africanist. I'm an African woman. And um, I self-identify in that way. And I... I'm happy to self-identify because in the past when I have declared and ones like me in the diaspora have declared we are African, you know, we would be asked, well, have you been to Africa? Can you speak African? You know, this kind of thing, as if that is the only way in which you are African. African is part of our heritage. It is, um, it is our DNA. It is our birthright. And that our history was interrupted because... Um, nation states decided to come into Africa, brutalize Africans, take them away from their families, um, put them into um, a, a way of being that means that we are always to be serving but never to be leading, does not make us any less African. That our accents have become European or French or German or whatever doesn't make us any less African. What has happened is that we have not been taught about ourselves. We have not enjoyed the benefits of rites of passage programs. We have been taught what it is to be African by other people. And so always you're going to be at a disadvantage because no one is going to tell you that you can be all that you can be. So, so motivated by that, I have been involved in um, empowerment programs and rites of passage programs. I've written on this. I have been on the radio. I have made it my business to um, have what I call difficult conversations. At this point, I have taken some leave from my um, post at the University of the West Indies. I have protected leave. And courtesy of them, I'm able to pursue something that has been in my heart uh, and spirit for the longest while. And that is about finding out what has happened to African people in the diaspora. I'm calling it a global African research trot. And I really just want to know about the education experiences of Africans in the diaspora and on the continent. The reason I want to know that is I want to determine what are the things that are working, what are the forms of resistance that we've employed to ensure that not all of us are uh, excluded from school, misdiagnosed, pathologized, criminalized, um, and all of the other things that come out of being miseducated or not learning about yourself. Many um, communities, especially in the UK and in other places, have uh, introduced, um, I guess, a, a kind of self-repair, uh, supplementary schooling, alternative schooling, uh, meetings in uh, community spaces, uh, in, the, in our homes. We have worked very hard to undo the damage that is done by the schooling system. And I am in a place now where I want to speak to the global African community about what I have found from the global African community. So this is not my idea and this is not us through the lenses of someone else. This is our voices speaking about our experiences and what we are doing to ensure that we can hold so, an equal place in global spaces at the table. So what have you found? Well, it's early for me to talk about the research because I'm still in the midst of it. I'm, I'm happy to be in Africa under African skies. I'm very Is this excited. Your first visit? I've been on the continent before, but I've Where? never been to Namibia. I've been to West Africa. Where in so I have been to the Gambia, I've been to Ghana on more than one occasion. I have actually been to visit um, African communities that have um, created populations in 
different places. So, for instance, uh, there is a, somewhere called the Village of Peace, called Demona, that uh, American Africans in their numbers have moved to Israel to create their own society so that we can be independent and we can teach our own. We can um, comfortably uh, perform ritual, connect with the Most High. We do it using our When you say tongues. rituals, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, how, how do we go about um, recognizing the Creator? How do we uh, acknowledge our ancestors? What are our practices? How do we uh, manifest humility? What is our covenant with the Most High? How are we ensuring that um, there is cultural transference? that those that died for us are not forgotten, that their work and their legacy is not um, lost. What Such is, is our role? Um, the question? Such as? Um, those who have died for us. Our ancestors who, who were in various forms of resistance, our ancestors who were captured and brutalized, but many of us don't know that it wasn't something that we just submitted to. Many of us fought, many of us lost our lives, many of us uh, left plantations or we worked, um, we worked quietly and strategically to help each other escape from bondage. We have had various forms of resistance. It has been in the form of music, the philosophies that have come through in the music, very strong, the, um, the vibrations, the, the non-verbal communication, the, um, the paradigms that, that we adhere to, that we recognize are okay, are often in conflict with the paradigms that others have. What we find acceptable in terms of how we take care of our children and our elders is not always um, seen in other communities. So we have a history as an African people of um, behaving and vibrating in a particular way, conducting ourselves in a particular way that other people can't teach us about. Other people will not teach us about uh, the, the, the sovereignty and the royalty and the divinity, uh, all of those aspects of ourselves that we must know about so that we can be our fullness and be very comfortable claiming an African identity, recognizing that some of us, me for instance, I am not able to converse with an African tongue because my tongue has become lazy because I've been taught by a people uh, for whom they had no interest that I should know these languages. They had no interest in me being able to communicate with ones that look like me with my brothers and sisters around the world. So I have taken the step to um, embark on this particular trod. I want to know what has happened and I want to report back. I want to do what I can in my small way to communicate the issues that have affected us and the solutions that we have created so that we can be the fullness and we can hold the rightful place. Um, when we see each other, we should recognize each other's divinity. We should hold each other in high regard. We should listen. We should know that there are ages and stages and norms that apply to us. Who's teaching us this? No one. So I'm glad to be here. So okay. glad to be here. All right. No, so. Um, you have been here for two days? Two or? whole days. Two whole days. <laughs> yes. Where have you been? That's a very good question. Um, I have been fortunate enough to meet a number of people in and around the wind. Is it Windhoek or Windhoek? Windhoek? Yeah, if you are, if, if, you, if it's English, then it's Windhoek. Uh -huh. If it's Afrikaans or German, you know, I think if it's Afrikaans, it's Wind Hook. Okay. Okay. Well, I have been in and around this place and I have met um, some very 
uh, intriguing and informative ones who have I've been very privileged actually to have conversations with people who are, are being very open and transparent about their perspective which is giving me an insight I haven't traveled around Namibia yet I have just well when I got here um, first of all I came in in the night and I was what time did you arrive? it was about I don't know one o'clock in the morning one o'clock in the morning what and happened? I opened the plane door How, what happened oh what my god happened? What happened? it was cold it was cold I mean why you arrived that late okay so I had I had come from the Caribbean so I took a long haul flight to London and then which is in itself a crime huh? that Africans in the Caribbean cannot fly directly to the continent of Africa this is completely shocking to me completely shocking so that I had to go through Europe to get to Africa when where I reside in um, the Caribbean in Barbados I am right next to the Atlantic Ocean. I come through Europe to come to a place that is on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, that in itself for me is something that should be spoken about. Africa should, Africans should not have to go through Europe every time Africans want to connect with Africa. So, long haul flight from the Caribbean to London, then flight from London to Germany, then from Germany to Namibia. Now, the first flight was scheduled to come in at 6.30 on the 30th of the month. The airline postponed the flight through, for reasons I don't know, but I just, you know, I give thanks to the Most High that the flight that I came in on was safe. And the one that they put on in its stead brought us into Namibia those early hours of the morning. So when they opened the plane door, I was struck by a cold, piercing wind. And in my naivety, I imagined that as I was going to Africa, I would be warm. <laughs> I tell you, it was as cold as being in London in the height of winter. It, it pierced me. But I am so glad to be here. So it, nothing could keep me away from here. Ice or fire or water or air. Nothing can keep me away from here. So I was so, I would give thanks. I was so pleased and thrilled to be here. I clutched my garments and I came down those flights and I stood on African soil and I was happy because although I've never been here before in Namibia, I am home. And I was met by Brother Tahuti. We, we drove through darkness. So I didn't even see where I was going. I was just driving through darkness towards what I know I'm supposed to encounter. And then I had three hours sleep, and about three hours sleep. And then I had uh, I met with Brother uh, Tehuti and we, we, we were just going and meeting people and talking and I've been listening and trying to learn about Namibia. Um, so, I haven't been to a lot of places. I've been to um, been to the town center, the town. I can't remember. I've driven around. I have seen the municipal buildings. I have been to the broadcasting um, uh, institution organization uh, briefly. I've gone to these places very briefly, but I am looking forward. I will be here for ten days. I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, not just, you know, first of all, you will see the, the first layer, you will see the, the pretty things, you will see the shiny things, and I love shiny things, huh? but I want to see what is under the surface. I want to know what has been happening to the hearts and minds of Africans here, and how, what strategies we're using to ensure that the systems that oppress and marginalize us are not the systems that continue to keep us from each other, first of all, because the diaspora should know about the diaspora and should know about the continent. We are six regions. We are regions in Africa, and there's a whole population of Africans who are stolen away from Africa who want to come home, but they don't know enough about this place. So I want to learn and share what I am divinely guided to share.
So I can't tell you about the outcome of the research yet. I'm still finding out. But um, it is a very interesting journey. Very interesting. Wow. Okay. So you have been to how many now? You said? How many what? Sorry. African states. So I've been to, I went to Israel. Huh? Uh, I met um, Africans living in Dimona. I consider that to be all that I saw, everything that I heard was about who we are, history, um, revelations that have not been taught to me in Europe. So the place is called Dimona. It's how called do you, Dimona. How, how do you spell it? D I M O N A. Okay. Okay. Um, I also have been to, as I said, I've been to Ghana. I've been to Ghana several times and I've been there in several capacities. I have been there on my own, um, you know, like many of us will take a pilgrimage to try to find out what we were never taught. But so in Ghana, where did you go? I went to Cape Coast Castle, I went to Elmina, I was uh, staying in Accra. Uh, I, went, I went wherever they would take me. I went to, um, I can't remember the name of the river, but there is a, a place where they would take us in bondage to, so that we could, in our chains, our chains, huh? put on us, we would be washed in this, uh, in, in, this, in this river before they would take us to the dungeons, before they took us through the door of no return and put us on ships and sail to places that we, we knew nothing about and many of us did not get to the destination because of the conditions and because of other reasons. Um, I've been to the Gambia, I've seen in the Gambia, um, what, what I see everywhere is the spirit of the African, everywhere I go I see the spirit of the African. Uh, sometimes we find a way to suppress it because it's not safe necessarily to articulate and express everywhere and in the presence of everyone but when we are in safe spaces and we, are, we know we are one with another the spirit of the African emerges if it is not through the drum and through music it is through our chanting it is through our non-verbal it is through our warmth it is through our trauma that we speak of it is through our desire to be elevated it is it is through our um, recognition that there is a supreme being we are not man is not the power money is not the power these are currencies and these are um, energies that we use to navigate this space but the omnipresent omnipotent uh, creator of all things is supreme and I have found that all Africans, when they know themselves, give reverence to that higher power, uh, express and conduct themselves in a way that is uh, uh, a form of observance. Uh, it is not about church. It is not about um, showing other people that you know we are in a gathering called church and we are wearing the newest clothes and we are judging each other by where we what we wear where we live and and how we speak the job we hold our office it's not about that it is about something far more fundamental and i think more of us need to know this i think we need to have systems of cultural transference that help to preserve us so that we can very confidently say we are African yes we have come from this place or that place we are we are African we're not ashamed of our uh, you know our wide nose and our wide hips and our full lips and our hair and our melanin and and our rhythm and our sound and our silence we're not we're not ashamed of it why should we be ashamed of it we, sh we should not be ashamed of it so I'm here to find out I'm here to find out, I'm here to, to be on purpose. So that, that, is, that is me, I hope, I, I hope I've introduced myself properly. <laughs> no, um, yeah, um, so when this spirit that you are talking about, when, when did you start feeling that now I'm feeling I've always, something? I've always, I, you know what, 
I can't remember when I started to feel it. I can, I can tell you about notions I had in my head as a child that um, maybe I didn't belong with this family or um, now I'm being raised in the UK and all I know is the UK but I can remember thinking I shouldn't be this cold uh, these people shouldn't be so rude uh, when I got to a certain age I said why is it my ancestors have pay paved the way and I still have to pay to get in how, how, how is this so um, so I would say these kinds of things to my parents. My father was the first philosopher I ever knew. I never called him a philosopher. I just wondered why he spoke in parables and how it was. You know how we can sometimes speak without actually speaking directly. We speak around it so that you can understand it if you analyze what's being heard. My father would do that. My father introduced me to... African drums and reggae music. My mother introduced me to um, the role within the family that you will nurture and take care and you will be um, soft but you will also be fierce if necessary. She showed me a, a dignified way of being. They both showed me how to continue to elevate and move forward even if you're in grief, even if you you encounter obstacles, I had a very, very early awareness of the need to do something, to right the wrongs that I was seeing. I was in a very privileged position, I think, that I had my mother and my father and my siblings. They were my friends. I was safe. But I was always pushing at the... Um, at the edges uh, are trying to find out why other people were not being given the same favor uh, so it, it is a very early age um, my mother used to I know be worried she would tell me hush when I would start to you know punch the air with my fist and wear denim I had an afro and um, and I loved Angela Davis. I just loved the civil rights movement. I, I when I saw the uprisings in Soweto, when I, when I, all of these things would just capture my attention. So when others were going off to do, um, you know, get married and all these things, I was looking at this resistance, this uprising, this this insistence that we will be treated right, and that people will not just come in and, and take everything that we have. So when I listen to, to this uh, period, it's like the 60s, 70s. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very much so. Alright. So, Fela Kuti and various, various yeah. artists, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, Third World, Mutubaruk, various people were talking to me. Um, they didn't know they were talking to me, they were talking to whoever was listening, huh? and I found myself listening. I found that uh, whilst I could enjoy music, I love music, I love drums, I love all of this, that it would call me to attention. Uh, it would tell me that we're speaking in a language other than English. English is not our first language. Uh, English was imposed on us. Um, these Eurocentric ideas are weapons and strategies to keep us oppressed and uh, I think it's important that we are compassionate and empathetic and forgiving but I think that we really need to have a, a wise head and heart so that we, we allow our children to make the contribution and be rewarded in the way they should be. Uh, we should have our elders feel that they've made a good contribution in the time they were here. No one should be taking their last breath or, or in their final years thinking, what was the point of all of this? This is, this, this is, it is too much for me just to sit by and, and do nothing. So here I am. I don't, I don't uh, go looking for this. This thing comes looking for me. Excellent. So when did you start um, growing your, your dreadlocks? Oh my gosh. Uh, my locks. They, were, they started growing inside first. I was going to say that. My locks have been growing longer than they've been on my head. Anyone who really listens to me will know that. Will know that. Um, 
I remember wearing my natural hair for many years and then I had a period where I, I experimented, I cut my hair off, I did a lot of different things whilst I was just playing with my, my physical form, uh, which is the right that I have. My ancestors made it so. I can do as I please with myself. Um, and then I said that uh, in, the, in the corporate world, uh, you recognize that... Uh, what is the corporate world? In the private sector. In the private sector, you know, to be melanin rich or dark skinned and uh, wear our styles and our colors is not always welcomed. Only recently, you know, with the uh, advent of certain films that are coming through, the latest of being the Black Panther, you know, you have this superhero who's an African and uh, you have this uh, secret civilization. Uh, in those, in those portrayals are hidden messages. Huh? So I would, in those environments, recognize that you have to present yourself in a certain way. But as I was doing this empowerment work myself, I realized that actually I was almost schizophrenic. In that world, I was looking like this. And in the other world, I was looking like that. And I said, no, these things must become one. These things must become one. So I was wearing my hair natural, but I would blow dry it so it appeared straight um, and avoid the rain, which a lot of African women do. <laughs> and then, but it's very difficult if you're going into a space where we're drumming and we're, and we're dancing and we're laughing. You know your hair is going to revert to its natural state. <laughs> so I've enjoyed this journey. I've enjoyed the... the, the so how know, did you handle that? The creator that plays with me. Well, the creator plays with me. The creator plays with me and helps me to remember that you can do as you please. But I, I reign supreme and I <laughs> remain. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I handled it by just, you just handle it. You say, okay, this is what happens. And then... Was I, there a moment when it really... You know, you felt, ish. I, why did I do that to my hair? No, not really. I, I respect the journey, huh? I respect the journey. If I don't respect the journey, I will be in judgment. I will be judgment of my sisters and brothers who I see who are, you know, straightening their hair or uh, wearing weaves. And I don't wish to be in judgment. We all have to do our own journey. We come to this... Um, in divine time. So I, I no, I, I have never been harsh with myself. Why would I be harsh with myself? There are so many people in the world who want to be harsh toward me, an African woman seeking to know who she, who she is and, and make a contribution. Well, I must join them? I don't think so. I, 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 I love myself. I am compassionate with myself. I think when you can do that, then you can do that better with others. If you can love yourself and forgive yourself and be compassionate with yourself, you can do that with others. So I don't sit in the place where I said, you know, why did I do that? No, I did it so I can now speak about it because I did it. I can speak to sisters who do it because I know why, because I did it. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, why, you know, why are you not like me? No, then who am I to do that? No. So. Um, I decided though, when I finished my doctorate, that when I was would, that? Uh, God, in two, early 2000, 2003 or something. But I was going to, I was going to walk across that stage with my cowrie shells and my symbols of, of, of Africa and on all of that. So I did that. I, I you know, that for me was the moment where I d decided to. Um, were less Western Eurocentric things and embrace more. Uh, I've already shown you. I know the Eurocentric way. I've already shown you. I understand your systems. What I don't understand and what I don't have is what I need to get from Africa. So that's why I'm sister doctor. That's why I'm not just doctor. Uh, I cannot give that much power to a Eurocentric system, any titles I get that I should hold in high esteem must come from Africa. They must come from Africa. So, you know, should I become a professor? It will be because it came from Africa. It came from my African community. It came because I was doing the work. I don't need to sit in front of them and pass their tests and, and, and pretend 
anything. What I need to do is find my my families and I need to do what I can to bridge the gap. There's a lot of healing that has to happen. So when we talk about reparations, we talk about repair. This is self-repair. We talk about um, a lot of people want to come back to Africa. They want to be repatriated. People must find Africa. However they find it, they must be able to do it. They must be supported in it. The trauma of what has happened to us must be healed. We must, be, we must not be ashamed of it because we didn't do it to ourselves. Um, so that's where I am. That's, wh that's where I am. So I'm glad to be in Namibia. I, I, you know why I got here? Give thanks. You know, what, you know why I got here? Because um, what I heard was so many diasporan Africans are heading to West Africa. There are Africans all over the continent. We must go all over the continent and find ourselves and learn about each other and make sure that no one else divides us. We must have our own media houses. We must have our own conversations. We must laugh. We must cry. We must dance. We must celebrate ourselves. That's where I am. That's where I am. That's what I'm about. And I give thanks. I give thanks.